I myself have a new morning habit that sort of has to do with the created world. I walk the dog. <laughs> now, I didn't used to do this, of course, because I didn't used to have a dog. But as I have shared with many of you, Noah and I adopted a dog a couple of days before the shelter in place order went into effect. We sort of had wanted a dog for many years, but thought, oh, it's, it's not the right time. We're out of the house too much. And that concern has been taken care of. It's a great time to have a dog. We're around the house a lot. And so we now have this adorable new housemate named Cece. I would let her make an appearance, but she's wandered off to nap in a corner somewhere. So every morning I go on a walk with the dog, which is good because uh, from what I know, dogs need walks. And it's also good because I need walks. I need to have some fresh air, especially in the early morning when there isn't anyone else around. And so when Cece first came home, I would take her on walks while listening to podcasts or the morning news. But that started to feel weird and strange. I felt like I couldn't give her enough attention if I also had my headphones in. And I began to feel that by listening to something else, I was keeping myself from where I truly wanted to be. So now all we do is we just walk. I don't put anything in my ears. I don't try to learn a new skill or catch up on the news. I don't talk, except occasionally to Cece to tell her that she's a very good dog. I listen to the birds. Sometimes I feel the rain or the morning mist. I started to notice the trees along my street that are showing signs of spring and I just let my thoughts float. I'm so grateful for this time in the morning. It's my time right now in creation. It's hardly wilderness, it's not even the lakefront, but it is good in its own small way. It connects me to the natural world and all of its inhabitants. And those moments are rare these days as I spend most of my time in my apartment. And so it was, as we've already sort of heard, it was sort of strange to celebrate Earth Day this year. After all, it's a day that honors the great natural world, the great outdoors, and yet we can't really be outdoors the way that we might usually. We can't really be outdoors without six feet of distance or masks. And so it did feel odd. And it made me miss the outside world more than I already do. And I really, really do. I miss outside. I miss you. I miss the earth. And I miss it because I'm part of it. We're all part of it. Earth Day isn't a Christian holiday. You won't find it on any liturgical calendar, but I think it's a day that Christians should honor. And so we're choosing today to celebrate it. Alongside congregations around the world, this is designated for many folks as Earth Day Sunday. And we're celebrating it because we are part of creation and because creation is part of us. And so on this Earth Day Sunday, we ask what Christianity says about the relationship between humans and the earth. What Christianity says about creation. Turns out, Christianity says a lot on these topics. So I figured it would be good to start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start, as the song goes. So in the book of Genesis, God says, let us make mankind, humankind, womankind, people kind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, one word may have stuck out for you there, dominion. I imagine you've heard that word before. If you hang out in Christian circles a lot, or if you look on Christian Twitter or Facebook, you've probably heard some debates about that word. And that word, dominion, has led to a lot of what I would call unfortunate theology about creation. And honestly, a lot of dangerous environmental policy. 
Some take that word, dominion, or this scripture passage to mean that humans are on top and that we can do whatever we want with the natural world as long as it benefits us. Some even go so far as to say humans can't possibly mess up the environment because God gave it to us. I'm not sure that that holds out. I've messed up lots of things that people have given to me, but that's what some people say, that we can't possibly mess it up and that God will actually repair anything we might break. Now, as you can probably guess by my tone of voice, I have a different definition of dominion. And we'll get to that. But I do want to say that I understand the confusion. I understand that a lot of people can read this verse and read that word and conclude, okay, humans can do whatever they want. But you need to read further in scripture. If you read more of Genesis, and if you keep on reading to Exodus and Leviticus, and then if you keep reading to the prophets and to the gospels and to the book of Revelation, you might come to a different because throughout scripture, God makes very clear that it is God's creation. Humans are in sort of a managerial position. We have dominion, but we are stewards. God never says, hey, here's a planet, have fun. God says, look at what I've created. Look how good it is. Look how much I love it. I have put my fingerprints all over it, and I made you humans like me, so that you might love it too. And God doesn't stop there. God goes further. God gives some instructions. God places boundaries on human consumption and use of the earth. God told those first humans, Adam and Eve, that they had guidelines. He said, till and keep the garden. God wanted them to be in relationship with the earth, to be gardeners, and caretakers. Well, we know how that ended, right? Humans didn't stay in the garden. But that didn't mean that God gave up. God continued to give humans chances and instruction on how to relate to the earth. Take, for instance, Sabbath, the Sabbath day today. It's meant for holy rest. But did you know that it's not just rest for humans? No, it's also a day of rest for animals, especially working animals. And it also, in the Bible, talks about Sabbath for the land. Every seventh year was meant as rest for the land, to keep the soil and the crops healthy. That's both good theology and good agricultural policy. And well, we know how that ended too, right? The soil doesn't get a lot of rest these days. Neither do working animals, and honestly, until recently, neither did many of us. As stewards, I honestly think we've gotten a bit out of whack. We've lost our alignment with God's purpose for creation, for land and living beings and ourselves. Stewardship doesn't mean do whatever you want. Stewardship means taking care of what belongs to someone else. And this creation it always belonged to God, a God who wants it to be around for future generations, some of whom we've heard from this morning. Collectively, humankind must rediscover this divine that is in creation, and we need to relearn our role as stewards. And guess what? If we do that, we're going to further connect with God, because God is in creation. Just Take a look at the scripture from Job. I actually have this Bible that's called the Green Bible. And there's verses in it that are printed in green whenever they have to do with the environment. And that scripture that Tim read for us, it's all green. Job is a fascinating book. And it's kind of a troubling book. It hits at some of the deepest existential questions we have. What is suffering? What is righteousness? What is divine power? It's honestly a really good book for the times that we're living in. And at the center of Job is this question, like Tim pointed out, why do bad things happen to good people? It's an important question. And the text doesn't give us a clear cut answer, which can be very annoying when scripture doesn't give us a clear answer. Job actually has all these viewpoints and puts them into conversation. But one thing that is clear in the text, as if you could see my green Bible, you would know, is that God is in creation. 
Job says that clearly. God is invested in the earth's well-being. And it's told through this beautiful poetic language. God knows the storehouses of snows and the wombs that bring forth ice and winter. God cares about rain falling on dry places. God knows the stars and their movements. This poem, it tells us that yes, Yes, humans are an important part of creation, but they're not the only part. And God cares about it all. As humans, can we come to love creation the way that God loves creation? Can we rediscover ourselves as stewards? Now, I'll be honest, there's many reasons to say no. There are many reasons to back away from the role of stewardship. For one, it's not easy. For another, there are a lot of social and political issues that might take our attention. Another reason, environmental degradation and climate change in particular can feel paralyzingly huge, an insurmountable problem. Conversely, sometimes it just doesn't feel urgent enough because the direct impacts aren't always easy for us to see. Many reasons to say no. Understandable reasons. But are they good reasons? Here's the thing. Caring for creation, it's a justice issue. It's an ethical issue. There's even a word for this, eco-justice. Our ability to care for the earth is connected to the social and theological and political issues that many of us already value with our time and our energy and our action. And eco-justice, it's connected to this moment that we're living in, to what is happening around the world with COVID-19. COVID-19 reminds us we're interconnected with one another and with the earth and with the other species that live here. Many people have said that the pandemic is a great equalizer. It's a nice thought, but it's honestly just not the case. The virus might not be prejudice, but the systems that people create and people, we are often prejudiced. People of color, the poor, the homeless, and the marginalized have been and will continue to be the hardest hit by this pandemic. And the same goes for climate change. Think back to Hurricane Katrina. Think about the wildfires in Australia and the impact on their indigenous community. The hardest hit are often going to be the marginalized communities. Eco-justice is bound up with the other social issues and inequalities we see every single day. In 1967, in his speech opposing the war in Vietnam, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said the following, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Today, churches across the world are reflecting on those words, the fierce urgency of now. And those words aren't just talking about a specific moment in the day. It's not the kind of time we can see on a clock. When he spoke those words, the Reverend Dr. King was talking about a different kind of time. Kairos time. In Greek, there were two different kinds of time. Kronos is the measured, definite form of time. The hours, the week, the date that we are losing track of, that's Kronos time. Kairos, on the other hand, is the fulfillment of the right action at the right moment. Kairos times are inspired times. Kairos times are action times. And often, often Kairos times line up with moments of difficulty. Jesus ministered in a Kairos time. Dr. King ministered in a Kairos time. And friends, we are living in a Kairos time. This is the fierce urgency of now. This is the moment to reclaim our role as stewards. Eco-justice, eco-stewardship, it's going to require global effort and cooperation. But it's a mistake to think that just because it needs this global response that our individual actions don't matter. Oh my gosh, of course, of course they matter. We need both individual and global cooperation. We need it right now 
in dealing and handling with this pandemic, and we are going to need it in the years to come with climate change. Because scientists, they've echoed Dr. King, and they have told us that there is such a thing as being too late on this. While we may not all be in a position to impact global policy, we can make our own choices, and we can refuse to be apathetic or complacent. It's my prayer that we will make the right choice as a community of faith, as individuals, and that we will live into this Kairos moment, and that in living into the Kairos, we will find hope. Hope because we can open our eyes and we can see the divine in creation. Hope because we can open our eyes and we can know what it is that we are fighting for. Hope because we can come together and we can actually do something. We can speak out, we can vote, we can protest, we can rescue things from the recycling and the trash, we can make a change. And in this Kairos moment, we don't have to return to the normal. Pastor Veronica preached this at the beginning of the pandemic. And I am hearing the echo of her wisdom every day. We don't have to return to normal. Not when the normal was destroying the planet. Not when the normal was crushing ourselves with work. Not when the normal was disconnecting from one another and disconnecting from life all around us. We don't have to go back to that. That's good, liberating news. That's Kairos news. It is Kairos time. And I pray that we will embrace it and do the right action at this right moment. My friends, let's not be late. Amen.